Here we go. Greetings, fellow armchair imagineers. Tiki here. Jacob Weil. And Alex. And welcome to the latest pitch from the So You Want to Be an Imagineer podcast network. That's right. It is Fantasia Forever. Ooh. Now, a few years ago, Jacob, myself, along with Blue Dragon 5 and Sandy Claus, collaborated on what might be my favorite pitch ever, which was Fantasia 3000. I'll have a link in, to the, in the description for that, uh, for you guys to check out. A lot, of, uh, a lot of cool ideas came out of it, but what I really liked was I really liked the idea of, like, everyone involved in the podcast getting a certain chunk of the action and it, you know you didn't have to step over anyone's toes to do it uh you know because we all got a say in it we all got like because fantasia is by its very nature a really kind of open-ended thing so with that in mind i have brought aboard mickey fan to collaborate with us uh mickey fan how you doing i'm doing fantastic this is, of course, kind of an extension of Sing Along November. Of course. Kind of a, another music-themed... Uh, for some reason, November just ended up being the music-themed month. <laughs> I don't know why. It's, a problem. <laughs> it's not a problem. I just don't really know the, the logic behind it. But um... Okay, so I'm just going to hand it over to you guys, because you guys, uh, you put a lot of prep work into this. You have a whole thing, so I'm just going to, I'm just going to let you guys riff for a while. Go ahead. Yeah, so. <laughs> All right, so, so we'd like, the, the film begins, I, I should be, I don't think we have an opening for this. And No, I, we... I said it, I said it, I basically wrote down in my notes that the tune-up segment was basically, you know, similar to the Fantasia 2000 tune-up. <laughs> All right. All right, just to set the stage here, these two, uh, I, I probably should have set this up a little better. These two, uh, basically, we all we all wrote three, uh, we all wrote three segments. These two came up with the order and also the uh, the inner the uh, inner the in between. Yeah, the inner yeah. the in betweens. And we have our our hosts are going to be Penn and Teller, which I'm very excited about. Uh, we landed on Penn and Teller because last time for Fantasia 3000, we did Michael Giacchino, and Michael Giacchino, like, he's amazing, he's obviously one of the best composers, you know, working today in, in, in modern, uh, film scores, but I don't necessarily think he's got the most magnetic screen presence to him in interviews and whatnot, and he's not really, like, you don't really know his face, and... So, like, well, Michael Giacchino, he has the pedigree behind him. I don't really know if he has the hosting capability from an entertainment point of view. Penn and Teller, on the other hand, um, I think that they are one of the uh, only parts of Fantasia 2000, along with Steve Martin, the uh, celebrity cameo parts, that actually hold up. Andrew so, Lansbury. Uh, well, yeah, okay, Angel Lansbury, sure, sure, calm down, Alex. Galactic <laughs> treasure. All right, all right, oh, God. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, we landed on Penn & Teller because uh, we can, you can do a lot with Penn & Teller. Like, they are very, very versatile in their, uh, in their style of humor and in their, uh, in their hosting delivery and whatnot. All right, so uh, these two came up with the format. They came up with everything. I am kind of going into that blind, but uh, as we get to each one of our uh, each one of our segments, we'll kind of uh, turn the reins over to the person who did the segment and just let them do a pitch on it. So, uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it. I'm going to turn it over to you guys. We have, we have some surprises in store. I'm going to say that much. Sounds good. Sounds good. So I'm going to turn it over to you guys. Okay, so as you as he said, as he said, we have basically the the or the orchestra tune up, which pretty much leads into the first piece. All right. For, uh, do you want to say the first piece? The first piece is 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 technically I I have the opening piece called known as Sakura. Sakura is a is a is a classical piece of Japanese music. And what and 
it's it's a it's a relatively short piece, clocking at probably close to around four minutes long, but and, and, and entirely and performed usually on a, on a Japanese instrument known as a koto, which is a, which is their which is a popular string instrument. Now as now for as for the actual format of the of the uh, of the short, it's going to be told in as as you might see on the thumbnail, on the thumbnail told in a, like a woodblock style, like animated woodblock style, as you can see. If I guess this is like supposed to be the abstract opening. Yeah. Of the, of so, the so with the woodblock style, you're you're talking something similar to like um, Studio Ghibli's uh, Princess Kaguya movie, right? Princess Kaguya. Yeah, kind of similar to that. Yeah, but more kind of close to like the for like closer ref for people, for other references, uh, like the the wood style, the block, the painting styles of ho of of Hokusai. And for other, and probably for a more wider range, the video game Okami. Yeah. That's the kind of visual style I'm going for. To see it animated is like, isn't a very common thing, and I think it would be pretty interesting to have an homage to that even in Fantasia. Oh, yeah, for sure. So, it's basically, basically how I'm envisioning the piece is like, it begins over like, over like, like basically, the background looks like a piece, you know, piece of piece of parchment, as it would as for wood painting. But then, like the opening sounds like sounds kind of reminded me of droplets of water. So the ocean be it begins with the, with the rivers of Japan. Basically, it, basically, it's kind of less abstract than our previous abstract openings, but it still kind of has that has it in the in the visual style of being of being unique from the rest of the movie. And basically, what it is, it touches upon like various aspects of ancient Japanese culture, like the, like their, like their vistas, the and so even like the, like and of course you can't have a shot of can't have a shot of it without the, without the sun rising from the sun rising from the east, since they are the land of the rising sun after all. Touch upon some of the Shinto gods. Basically, and even though it's even though it's and all like basically going about their day being peaceful. All ending on all ending on a shot of of Mount Fuji, surrounded by cherry blossoms, hence nice. the name nice. Sakura. All right, uh, Jacob. What I really like about this choice as an opening pick is I feel like it sets the tone for our overall catalog this evening, which is going to be kind of uh, it's going to be sort of Fantasia evolved because we've got some we've got some pieces from stage shows in here. We've got some jazz pieces in here. Uh, we've even got a pop piece in here. So um, with that in mind, I, I feel like this is sort of like the next step up from just purely classical music, uh, while still definitely sticking to the, to the Fantasia format. And with that in mind, there's also, uh, you know, stuff with a more international flair as well, and that is uh, definitely a great way to showcase that. So great choice for an opener. Thank you. Oh, right. right. After our, after our, after the Sakura, after that segment ends, and we get to we we are introduced to our hosts for this program, Penn and Teller, and to which and to which they introduce introduce our next and to and introduce our next pick, yep. South Pacific. Mm. Okay, so really quick. Uh... Really quick with Penn and Teller, there's no. Is there any like antics with them, or is it just very, yeah, very much so like? Yeah. So when they're introducing South Pacific, we're gonna have Penn introducing the t the uh, piece, um, and then Teller's going to be you no know, to his side, and he's gonna be pulling out animatronic birds and <laughs> white masks and all that kind of stuff out of a hat. The time nice. of the, what was the name of the tiki god that we that we had in there? Uh, Yes. Tongaroa, like they pull like a penny, even pulls like a Tongaroa mask out of the hat too. Nice, nice, nice with the tongue and everything. <laughs> yep. yep. Okay, while, so all the while, Pen Pen is none the wiser to what's going on behind him. Yeah. So South Pacific, of course. Uh, Alex, who who composed this one? Do you know? Uh, Rogers and Hammerstein. Well, yeah, but like, did they uh, did they both compose it, or did one of like who wrote uh, the music? Because I know one of them wrote the music and one of them wrote the lyrics, right? 
Uh, Richard Rogers wrote the music. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so yeah, Richard Rogers. Um, South Pacific, of course, one of the most game-changing shows in uh, Broadway history, probably the birth of the modern musical narrative, if you will. One of my all-time favorites. Of course, I'm I'm tiki. I love anything Hawaiian, anything Polynesian. So, you know. So, basically, this is going to be uh, sort of tiki's insert some park stuff into Fantasia via a musical number. And the last time I did this was the Grand Canyon segment in Fantasia 3000, where I basically did like a beat-by-beat -beat recreation of the on the trail, uh, except I kind of expanded it, and uh, I, I did it like based on the Grand Canyon diorama from uh, Disneyland, using that same piece of music, but the whole piece of music. And basically what I did was I made it kind of like a multiplane experience. So, uh, so for South Pacific, what we're going to do here is it's going to be a sort of a lush Hawaiian environment, uh, very much watercolor, like think Lilo and Stitch. Uh, but even more pronounced than Lilo and Stitch was, even more kind of enunciated. And essentially what we're going to have is, uh, I kind of liken this to the uh, the Pastoral Symphony, where it's going to be a take on the Hawaiian gods and goddesses. And so as each, as each part of the overture plays, we get a different, uh, we get a different god or goddess uh, kind of doing their thing. So it starts with Bali High, Bali High, and uh, as we hear Bali High, we kind of get a nice panning shot into the Hawaiian island, into the rainforest of it all. Uh, we see kind of like all the, you know, different wildlife. This is kind of setting up the naturalistic beauty of the location before we see the characters. And then we get to nothing like a dame, and that's Maui showcase, man. And this isn't Maui uh, from Moana. Oh no, we're gonna bring back the Disneyland version of Maui. And uh, he's basically a ladies' man, you know. So he's walking around the island. He's got a lot of swagger. Essentially, what I'm gonna do with the uh, character designs for the gods and goddesses is I'm just going to kind of stick to how they look in uh, in Disneyland, where the whole Island is going to be populated by these uh, these wooden tiki people, and that's pretty much what they're going to look like. Um, so Maui, he's got a lot of swagger. He's walking around, you know, uh, with uh, there's nothing like a dame, nothing in this world. And then uh, then we go to Bloody Mary, and that's kind of Bloody Mary is kind of a song like weirdly about like you know uh, an undesirable relationship. <laughs> And what better to represent that than, uh, I am Pele, goddess of fire and volcanoes. I torment poor Negende, the earth balancer. <laughs> so, basically, we see, uh, kind of like a giant personified volcano for the form of Pele. And then Negende is going to be represented sort of like, uh, sort of just the roots of the volcano. He's going to be sort of like upside down. And uh, so, you know, is the whole like, da 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 uh, It's going to be kind of like a push and pull of like the, uh, the kind of like the earth, the trembling of the earth that, that uh, Pele's eruptions are causing and Negende trying to balance that. Uh, let's see. Then what else is uh, Alex? Can you help me? What else is in the uh, is in the South Pacific Overture? Do you remember? No, I know some is there. Yeah, what? Not off the top of my head, I don't remember. Okay, I'm pretty sure the uh, I'm pretty sure it's younger than springtime, and then some enchanted evening. So uh, young and uh, younger than springtime is going to be uh, Hina. The uh, goddess of wind and, uh, wait, Hina is the east wind. No, I'm sorry, Hina, I'm sorry. Hina is the goddess of rain. And then we're going to have Tangaroa Ru, uh, the, uh, the east wind. And so it's going to be kind of like a symphony of wind and rain. And 
Uh, we're going to kind of see the wind and the rain personified the same way that the elements are personified in Frozen 2. Just kind of, uh, you know, just kind of like playful and wisping around, sort of personified by leaves and whatnot. Yep. And then we're going to get to Some Enchanted Evening, which is the big finale, and that's tang that's all the gods and goddesses gathering around the giant tree, and we're talking like a tree of life-sized Tangaroa. And uh, as some enchanted evening kind of a da 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 da, da. and uh, all the uh, all the gods and goddesses kind of start to waltz. Uh, fireworks light up the night sky, and the fireworks kind of transition out into Ben and Teller. All right, nice. Alex, thoughts? I am. Very impressed. I did not go into that level of detail for any of mine. <laughs> well, I'm very familiar with South Pacific, so... That's fair. It was easy to write just because I kind of ha had, like, mini songs. Like, I don't think any of my others are going to be as detailed. So don't get too intimidated. Um, because the overture is basically, like, mini songs that I could connect to oh. the characters that I'm already very familiar with. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right. What's next? Uh, right, speaking speaking of familiar characters, when we paint a pen and teller, we have our familiar congratulations, Mister Tukowski moment. Well, no, no, no. That's wait. That's after this one. Wait, yeah, but yeah, but um, yeah. So, well, so, Mister Tukowski <laughs> thing is after the second segment. No, after it's after the third one. Oh, after the third yeah. one. Which okay. Is okay. the yeah. comedian I... with Mickey Donald and Goofy? Yes. That, that this is the one. This is one I did. Gotcha. Okay, take it away, Jacob. All right. I mean, the, my, my I, unfortunately, I didn't have much. I don't have much detail for this one, but I do have like a basic, basic plot laid out for it. Like, it's basically going to be like a standard Mickey Donald and Goofy cartoon, but in like set to the set to the comedians. But like, but it begins when they're tested and they're with another familiar face, Ludwig von Drake. Nice, love it. And they're then he said Ludwig von Drake shows them a shows them a new invention, a time machine. Mm, okay, yeah, you got my attention. <laughs> so basically, so ba basically, I was inspired to do that part by like the bas basic concept of what I learned from the actual actual music itself was like it was actually written for a play where like these uh these children's plays where there's like these like this scientist shows the show some buffoons his inventions so so that's why i got the basic concept so they go back and so they go back in time and like what happens is that mickey Donald and goofy are made the gestures of of a ruthless king's court and, and a ruthless king's court, and Ludwig von Drake is made the is forced to be the assistant to a to a to a mad alchemist. Oh God! <laughs> so basically, I mean, unfortunately, I don't have like well, what happened? What happens? Like they they plot various ways to escape, and until it gets to the point where they where they're going to be executed. Oh. Trying, you know, trying to get back to their own time. The. The ending is like it basically could be this high stakes adventure where like high stakes adventure where the, where they're both trying to get trying to get to the to fix the time machine as it's teleporting all around the all over the place and the while the, all the while the king's guards and the king himself is chasing after them and they and they get home just in just in the nick of time and then when they get back they all just pitch in and destroy the invention all right all right i like it nice um, I like that you go more ambitious with the characters, and of course the reason you did that was because Fantasia, we had the Mickey short, Fantasia 2000, we had the Donald short, I did a Goofy short for Fantasia 3000, um, so of course we did a trio short now. And also, I like the fact that you worked in other characters, because for my uh, Goofy short, I also had, had a Dumbo, because I did Goofy doing a Baby Elephant Walk which I'm still super proud of. It's literally just Goofy taking Dumbo for a walk. <laughs> that is <laughs> so such well. a wholesome idea. 
right? I, I think it works so well. <laughs> it is. A, it, was, it really was a wholesome idea. Like, and what? And I use and another reason I went with Von Drake at the head first because I thought I mean, at, it was what I thought was like his technically his first theatrical debut, but apparently he appeared in, in theaters in like a in like a very obscure feature at one point at one point but yeah 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 he was definitely in some obscure featurettes for sure like like one at least one that was released theatrically uh -huh. so, but, so but like this would like be like his full like his full like grand debut on stage like and and of course being a club being fantasia this would be told in, entirely through pantomime uh -huh. without it without any dialogue whatsoever I think, of course, I think, and of course, like when Mickey, like we, Mickey would try and corral them to be the Jets. He's like, you know, let's play along. Donald obviously trying like be the first to attack, and Goofy would just, you know, go along with the whole thing, do whatever he does. <laughs> I like that it's basically an episode of Back to the Future, the animated series. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, th I didn't think about it like that, but it kind, but it kind of is. I, I but, that is not a bad thing, Jacob. I, I, <laughs> I mean, and if you listen to actually listen to the music, it kind of does have like a bit of like some segments of it actually do kind of like a, like a a med like a medieval kind of vibe to it. So mm -hmm. that's, it's kind of like where I and Von Drake plus medieval. There we go. I got the idea for a time machine. Nice, I mean, nice. It's not it's not the most it's not the most creative story for that, but it kind of works for like and of course it like works Von so well with the music and with the characters. It's, and and von Drake like being forced to assist an alchemist is like it's like it's like science versus it's like science versus magic yeah <laughs> which of course would be exasperating to him being forced to adapt <laughs> which I th and von and though von Drake is mostly known for like his funny accent his funny Austrian accent he is he's also can be well known for like his particular actions, so I think it would, he would still work well, even if he's he, silent. He feel he's an incredibly animated character. Yeah. So, I, so I think he would lend himself well to that environment. All right, cool. All right. cool. And of course, the closing, of course, closing my short is, as I mentioned earlier, the, the congratulations Stokowski moment where they all, they all like shake hands with Penn and Teller and is Von kind of, Drake there as well? Yes. Like, yes. Okay. Yes, he's he's confounded by the meta. You must tell me how this magic works. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. And, yeah, and then we have we have a little bit while while they're all shaking hands. Teller grows extra arms. <laughs> awesome, awesome. <laughs> you see, that's exactly why I thought Penn and Teller would be a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> all right. All right. So then we don't we don't have a uh, we don't have a uh, intro for this next segment, but well that's okay because the the whole Mr. Sikowski moment is pretty much the yeah. interlude there. Um, but next up we have Vivaldi's The Four Seasons, which is one of mine, um, and I've actually given this one a nickname. I've called it uh, Winds of Revolution. Ah, so basically. You no, know, I don't have I don't have this entire story fleshed out, but uh -huh. you know what I what I'm going to do here is um is telling the story of this fantasy kingdom in uh, you no know, the arms of revolution. Um and we have this young princess who meets a rebel and they fall in love um and they basically become pawns in the bigger machinations of the monarchy and the rebellion. Um, and it ends up as, you know, this really tragic star-crossed oh, wow. romance where no, no one wins. No, the rebellion, the rebellion is victorious, but it is... A very, very hollow victory. Damn, that's we... dark, Alex. Damn. <laughs> kind of like, I didn't realize we invited Dragon to this one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, oh, holy be... shit. Seriously, that, that's short and but, sweet, Alex. <laughs> and, but, no, it's this really, really wholesome romance. As you go through a year, you go through the seasons, you see them falling in love, and you see them realizing what's going on. And you... They 
it just all feels futile. And they realize that, and it's just, like, it is a genuinely heartbreaking moment. You know, you, you mentioned you thought that another one of, that one of yours was going to be the Rite of Spring of this, Tiki? No, yes. this is the Rite of Spring of our, mm, of uh, our Fantasia. I don't because know. Because it I... has that heartbreaking ending. I don't necessarily agree with that, Alex, just because with Rite of Spring, Rite of Spring isn't necessarily a narrative. This is this seems very narrative heavy. I mean, yeah, but arguably so is Rite of Spring. I mean, kind of, but Rite of Spring isn't near isn't like character focused by any means. Oh no. Absolutely. This is far more character focused yeah. than it is. Very narrative based. I and think I, you're going to find that Pharaoh's dance is a little closer to like how Rite of Spring plays out in terms of the structure. Okay. Yeah. But I definitely in terms of tragic endings. Yeah. I mean, I you've got. Oh damn! That is literally like the darkest. That's like little match girl dark dude. Yeah. Which actually, and, which, which I think know, at one point was supposed to be part of a Fantasia project. Yes. Oh, was it? Fantasia World, I believe. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, but like, no, this one I I just envision being done in that very, very classic Golden Age Disney, you no know, Snow White, Pinocchio, Bambi, that era of Disney style. By the way, I want to just point out that for this, uh, for these Fantasia pitches we've been doing, we're uh, it, it's like it's super like wish fulfillment that if they ever did a Fantasia, like a that'd be wish fulfillment in its own right if they ever did another Fantasia. But B, if they... I, I do think a CG Fantasia would be an interesting endeavor, but... Uh, it would feel hollow. I don't necessarily agree with that. It would, have to, it would have to look good. Yeah. Every segment would have to have a different style to it. That's all like, they yeah. have to do. Like for 3,000, so they pitched a stop-motion one. Right, right. But uh, anyways, uh, let's, uh, let's, let's get back to it. Yep, so, and Except with that, actually, yeah, actually with that uh, very, very, very depressing ending, we go into an intermission. Oh, wow, okay. <laughs> um, and then uh, we come back and we jump right into our next segment with pet sounds. You motherfuckers literally aren't even going to ease the tension with some Penn and Teller stuff, are, are ya? Nope. Like, no, like, no Teller crying you know, crying silent nope. tears or anything like that. Nope, we're we're going right in. We're going right into it. Well, we we originally had like some other kind of idea planned, but we realized that considering that yours is supposed to be also kind of like a a darker story, we decided against decided against Penn and Teller. Yeah, it didn't. It, it didn't. It felt like it would uh, be totally ruin inconsistent. The flow. Yeah, it wouldn't be totally consistent. Wait, you think Pet Sounds is a dark story? I mean, thought for gave you that indication? Well, I mean, the way, the, your, the way your, you worded your it. Your idea for it, no, not quite dark, but very thought-provoking. Okay, I think, I think I'm going to disappoint you guys. I think you're hyping it up too much. How did I word it? Now I'm curious. It looks like a commentary on, like, what's happened to Hawaii, basically. Okay. Mm, that's interesting. I think I might have switched gears with it a little bit to tell you the truth. <laughs> okay, then let's hear it. Well, we can we can work in some we can retcon it. <laughs> right. Um that was my initial idea, but I honestly think that's a little too cynical. Um and I I guess with uh with South Pacific being included, I kind of wanted to mirror South Pacific a little bit more. So, with the animation style for this, whereas South Pacific was, uh, you know, it, it's watercolors, but it's still traditional Disney, you know, it's, yeah. it, it's still traditional Disney. This is going to be kind of like the, uh, the Aquarius de Brazil of, uh, Hawaii. It's going to be very log. surreal, uh, very, uh... You know, just kind of colors fading into other colors. But by the same token, it's also going to have kind of a, a semi-runny narrative to it. 
So essentially, and of course, just to set it up, pet sounds. Uh, whenever I say the words pet sounds, they think they think I'm talking about the album, but I'm not. I'm talking about the song at the end of the album that is fully instrumental. Um, Brian Wilson intended Pet Sounds to be a symphony. I think it counts. It's uh, it's definitely a pop song. It's definitely the most pop that we've ever had in Fantasia, but I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. I just think it's an evolution of the Fantasia format. But, um, so essentially with, uh, with Pet Sounds, we're following a train. We're following a sugarcane train in the middle of Hawaii. And there is some mild commentary on the industrialization of Hawaii. Uh, but, I, like, it's not, like, you guys are, like, based on the way you're hyping it up, it makes it sound like I'm gonna, like, fucking do some, like, Pink Floyd-level social commentary or something. I'm not. <laughs> like, that was never my intention with this piece. <laughs> but, uh, essentially, uh, dogs are gonna be chasing... The sugarcane train, which I guess could be a metaphor for like, oh, it's just in Hawaii, we're all chasing that that tourism thing. Uh, but that's just basically to uh, to end out the song, which does end out with uh, with the sound of dogs chasing a train, which is one of my favorite endings to an album ever, bar none. Uh, anyways, I as you can tell, this is probably out of my three. This is definitely the least developed. But it's it's essentially going to show just kind of like Hawaii in the modern day and kind of the highs and the lows of it. So the tourism industry, but also the beauty of it, the naturalistic beauty of the place that's still there. And we're kind of going to blend it together. And yeah, a way that's like in a way that's slightly melancholy, but I also feel like uh it's upbeat in its own way as well, and I think even though it does have a little bit of social commentary in it, goddamn, I think I certainly think it's a uh, a pick me up after four seasons. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, well, it's, it's a hell of a pick me up. Well, the proposed uh, Penn and Teller sketch we did was like they were riding around in a miniature version of Casey Jr. wearing Hawaii shirts. <laughs> Can we keep that? Yes, let's keep. Let's work. I want to keep that. I want to keep that yeah. because I feel like that would be an excellent kind of like after intermission, like, and we're back. Yeah, <laughs> yeah let's little, uh, meet the oh. soundtrack esque point. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we can we can wreck. We'll, we'll retcon it. <laughs> all right, all right. Work it into our head cannon. <laughs> oh. Alright, so yeah, like I said, I don't have that much developed for this, but then again, it's only a two-minute piece, so it wouldn't really last that long. Like I said, if anything, it's kind of surreal with kind of, not necessarily the imagery, but definitely the color palette. The color palette would be very, very Mary Blair-esque, but not Small you know, World Mary Blair, more it. like, not Small World Mary Blair, but more kind of like Three Caballeros Mary Blair. You still know we love to see it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, so that's basically it. It's like uh, Pharaoh's dance is going to be a lot more detailed. Okay. Well, so next up we have um, something a little different for Fantasia. Um, we have, we're going to go into a segment called the Jazz Corner. Okay. <laughs> that's, 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 that's how Penn and Teller dub it. Yeah, that's, love, that's what Penn and it. Teller dub it. Um, it's basically, yes. That's great. It's basically a uh, brief evolution of jazz music. Um, so because, for our, because because not only did we like we only kind of we actually incidentally stationed them kind of chronologically too. Yeah. How um, many jazz pieces do we have? We have three. Oh okay. Oh wow. Let's have. What segment are we on? We, so this is the... I grouped them together as one segment. Yeah, I know, but like what, like how many, how many are after this? Are after the, uh, the jazz corner? Uh, just two. Just two, okay, got it, got it, okay. 
All right, keep going. What's the first one? Yeah. So first one, um, you know, so we have uh, Penn and Teller uh, introducing the segment, Penn, um, and then you know their funny little bit to go into the first segment is that they're uh, getting ready for a race, and Teller is very clearly cheating. <laughs> um, but that leads us into our first piece, Flying Home by Benny Goodman. Okay, okay. Uh, which is one of mine. And, you know, very, very simple. It's very short. It's like, it is three minutes and 17 seconds. Um, but it is, um, it's going to be done in the Paperman style. Nice. Um, so the nice. 3D, 2D combination. Um, and, you know, basically it's just going to be a man running through the streets of New York. Cool. And that's, that's about it. Oh, wow. All right. <laughs> not quite as ambitious as your last very, piece, but I like it. No, it, it's not as ambitious as the Four Seasons at all, but it is, you know, <laughs> it, it's a very simple, you know, very aesthetically pleasing piece. Okay, okay, I like it. So yeah, and then we go into another uh, pen and teller bit, which leads us into corner pocket. Well, what's what's the pen and teller bit? We don't know. Um, <laughs> well, the pen and teller bit is like is is kind of a it's kind of like foreshadowing. Like it's like they're both at they're like in like in a casino esque area reading newspapers. I mean, it's not really it's not really that funny, but it, like it leads into what the actual actual short is about. Yeah, no, that's fine. Not not every one of these Penn and Teller things has to be, you know, uh, a laugh riot. It's fine. Yeah. They can just be setups. Well, my my next my this, this bit is mine, and the okay. bit is is Corner Pocket by one of the classics by Count Basie. Oh, Count Basie. Okay. Oh man. All right. I like. Yeah, I like this evolution of jazz thing. <laughs> he definitely is a is like a predecessor to Miles Davis. All right, all right, cool, cool. That that gets my that gets my music nerd juices flowing. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the visual style represented in here is kind of like that of uh, it's kind of that of like pulp newspaper comics. Mm -hmm. think, 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 some of you might be familiar with the uh, with the Disney Plus spar short circuit short just a thought. Yeah, like kind of animated like that, but in black and white with more shadows and half tones. That's kind of that's kind of the visual style I'm going for, for this one. The style, the 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 story of the short is kind of a, is kind of a unique one. Kind of how in like the last, kind of like how in Fantasia three thousand, I kind of pitched a, I kind of had a detective solving crimes from Funeral March for a Marionette. And in this case, I have a tr I have a. I have a, a gang of smooth criminals robbing a casino. <laughs> Interesting. Yes. Basically, basically, it's kind of like kind of like a, like a, a different take on Ocean's Eleven in a way. Okay. Yeah. I mean, like, kind of like you know, like it, even though, and even though it's kind of like all black and white with half to, I it's, I just. It it kind of starts off looking like that, just a thought, but it does add does add color here and there to highlight various parts of the casino, kind of like uh, kind of like how Sin City did with theirs. Okay, yeah. So even the even the movie Sin City did the whole black and white with occasional splashes of color. Yeah. So that's kind of what I'm going for there, and like it's kind of like uh, Ocean's Eleven meets Tarantino esque in a way. Obviously, nobody's gonna get no, nobody's gonna be too bloodied up or or killed or any <laughs> or anything. But it's basically just like you know a classic a, a classic classic you know, heist movie. Yeah, classic uh, swashbuckling heist movie kind of. Nice, nice. nice. Where we where we and their and their uh, and their goal inside the casino is to steal a mysterious briefcase. <laughs> okay, <laughs> very Pulp Fiction esque. And that's actually kind of like the the ending where they actually succeed and they look inside, but we don't. But we don't get to see what's in it. <laughs> All right, I like it. I like it. I mean, if you listen to the piece, it's like a, it's like 
like has has the same kind of structure here and forth, but it like builds and builds like the do 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 do, which kind of lends itself to like high octane sports, but also like to action scenes, but also has like this kind of like smooth kind of like smooth and sly kind of sound to it. In the back, in the background, as entertainment, as like like an entertainment, since the casino is kind of an entertainment venue, I have like a have like a version, like a comic version, comics ver- accurate version of uh, of Count Basie performing it. Okay, nice, and it's, and nice. It's, and it's synced to the music. Like it. Mm, good stuff. Good stuff. All right. So I assume the next one is Pharaoh's Tales. It that is. is. That is correct. A pen and Heller antics. Um. So, um. Well, Penn is introducing the segment. He's locking Teller into a sarcophagus. <laughs> um. And as he finishes, Teller Teller's escaped, and he comes in from the side wearing a pharaoh's headdress. It's very simple, very classy. Yeah. Love it. Love it. <laughs> okay. Oh man. Oh, that, that's oh, that's so classic. Penn and Teller. Nice. <laughs> All right. Pharaoh's dance. This, in my opinion, is the rite of spring of this piece. Uh, twenty minutes long. I think that is the longest Fantasia piece ever. Right? If I'm not mistaken. Oh, no. 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 What, what is rite of spring is. In the forties, no, well, I mean, no, I mean, well, not not in the actual movie though. Minutes. The segment is only like twenty five minutes in the original. I can okay, so it's a little longer. All right, fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> that looks like the original composition is closer to forty minutes, but no, there's no way the actual segment is forty minutes. Yeah, um, I, think, I think it's like twenty five thirty. Huh. I just I just found this segment. It's only twenty two minutes. Oh, all right. So this song is a trip, man. It's it the closest thing I can compare it to is Pink Floyd. Honestly, uh, just the way that it just very slowly builds up, builds up, builds up, and then kind of like has this wild crescendo, and then sort of slowly builds back down again. So, uh, what was my inspiration here? Well, I took the title pretty literally, and I decided to do Ancient Egypt. So, essentially, what we're going to do, we're going to do a very, very, very slow build-up. Much like the song itself, much like Rite of Spring, we're going to start in the outer reaches of space. We're going to slowly fade in from space into Egypt itself, from Earth. And then, uh, then once the horn section kicks in, boom, we see the construction of the pyramids. We see armies of people hauling massive bricks up to put the pyramids in place. And the music just gets very, very, uh, very energetic, very, uh, intense as, as these pyramids start to erect themselves in the middle of the Egyptian desert. And then, um, as we kind of go into the first sort of inner interlude of the piece, we kind of zoom in to these now established pyramids. We zoom into the tombs. And as we see the hieroglyphics on the tombs, they start to come to life. They start to dance along to the music. The music grows more frenzied, more intense, more intense. Um, as the hieroglyphics along the cave walls, uh, we kind of go into like a full-on animated hieroglyphic segment where uh, every, like, it's... You know, it, it, it's basically just kind of like a, a very unique stylized uh, kind of uh, bridge in the middle of the segment. And then the crescendo happens, and this is essentially where we see the god Anubis represented in the stars, uh, kind of like Apollo in uh, in the Pastoral Symphony, sort of just like unleashing this wild, wild, just kind of like surrealist explosion into the Egyptian landscape, and there's, like, all kinds of, like, crazy psychedelic lights hitting the pyramids. Um, it, it's essentially a freakout as the crescendo of the song happens. And uh, we see Anubis kind of just uh, just sort of controlling it from the uh, from the night sky, kind of, like, almost sort of, like, Sorcerer Mickey, Mickey-esque, you know what I mean? Just kind of, yeah. like, 
sort of uh, just playfully controlling like all this crazy psychedelic shit that's going on. And then, as the sun starts to come up, almost Bald Mountain style, uh, the crescendo kind of dies down, the music slowly fades away, and we get one last shot of uh, of the Sphinx and the giant pyramids in uh, right as the uh, right as the sun rises, starting to peek over the horizon of the desert. And that's mm. <laughs> nice. Quite impressive. That's very impressive. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Mickey Pan, what do you think? Right of spring? Or, yeah, right of spring. Very right of spring. Ah, I knew it. I knew it. I think yours is very much kind of a steadfast tinge soldier, if it's anything. Yeah. Although, I would argue yours is definitely little match girl before anything else. Oh, yeah, it's definitely. Well, both, well, they, well they're, both, they're both Hans Christian Anderson, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, I would say yours is definitely Little Match Girl, which was going to be a Fantasia segment anyway, so whatever. <laughs> it counts. It's very much, it, it was very much in that spirit uh -huh, uh -huh. of, I want to break every single child who is watching this. <laughs> God. I can't say I, I kind of did that with like one of my pitches last time, with as I mentioned as my uh, dance macabre short. Which oh yeah, yeah, right, right. Which I mean, which kind of I kind of matched Dragon with that one. Even he was kind of off put by that. <laughs> so none of the stuff here is in the stuff I did here was entirely overly dark. <laughs> so I think no, a, I picked up that slack. Yeah. I kind of <laughs> I want to do a bit of change of pace, but I really like the whole. What was the, outside of the hieroglyphics? What's the plan visual style for this one? Um, like I said, just more kind of like surreal. Like we have like the galaxy is we have kind of like the uh, the fate like in the construction of the pyramid segment. It's going to be very much uh, tiny human figures that look almost like ants carrying these massive bricks so the scale is going to be all over the place uh there's going to very much be like a sense of heat and erosion in the desert so a lot of uh you know a lot of, uh, kind of line work there that's going to kind of replicate that uh sort of like almost mirage looking uh so essentially it's just going to be very very surreal nice okay so yeah we have no, another Penn and Teller insert that I don't think we thought of anything for this next one, did we? I don't recall. Okay. Um, but yeah, we have another Penn and Teller insert, and then we go on to the Overture from Showboat, uh, which is one of mine, and I have, uh, <laughs> I've also given this one a nickname, Memories of a Steamship. Okay. Um, so very much in the style of the old mill. Um mm. Where, nice, you know, nice. it, it's, no, be, no, but a um, little bit different of, you know, um, so it's the Overture from Showboat, um, the original one, which is mostly Misery's Coming Around and Why Do I Love You. Um, so, you know, very, very, no, so basically we just go through this rotting steamship um, and we flash back to it in its glory days. We see, you no, know, the, you know, we see, you no, know, basically everything that was going on. Um, basically flashing forward and back in time as an illusion. Um, you know, just kind of a thoughtful little piece is how I'm considering it. Okay, I like it. I mean, you really, with the old mill comparison, you really don't need that much detail. It kind of writes yeah. itself, honestly. Oh, yeah. Um, and then we have one more. Uh, we wanted to spring on you as a surprise. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. It's like, what? Well, we have one final Penn and Teller segment. Okay. Yeah. It's like, it's like, we have now like to join, join us for the final song of our program. Okay. As a Look out Mr. Into the uh, Bob Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> now that would be a way to do fan service for just Tiki. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is a niche of a one person. Yeah, oh yeah. 
He's like, look, look out into, look out into the stars as, as we close on our final segment, the planet suite. Yes. Okay. So we stop hosts the planets. And what and what we plan to be like the most ambitious Fantasia segment ever. Yeah, really? basically. Okay. So we want it to be. It's going to be done in one shot. Oh wow! Okay. Um, so, and basically, what you no? Know, when we were brainstorming this, what we kept on coming back to was each you no know, each planet represented. I kept describing this to Jacob as the Sailor Moon of it all. Um, <laughs> So each planet has their representative, um, and they kind of match the match basically the description of each planet. So which, from which the I can, which, which I can I'll try to find here. It's, I got them uh, right here. All right, go right ahead then. Yeah, Sorry. So we have Mars, the bringer of war; Venus, bringer of peace; uh, Mercury, the winged messenger; Jupiter, the bringer of jollity. Uh, Saturn, bringer of old age, Uranus, the magician, and Neptune, the mystic. Um, so, you no, know, basically, you no, know, we have all those, you no, know, we have all those, um, you no, know, representatives, and, um, you no, know, again, this is going to be one shot, um, and basically, them going, you no. Know, going about their day as it builds up. You know, so we have, you know, the Mar, you know, the Mars representative who is going you no, know, who's going to be like very warrior. You no. Know, I I had the mental image of Wonder Woman kind of. Mm -hmm. Um and then, you know, we have Venus who I don't remember who I, the mental image I had of that was, but um, well, basically the story was uh, at that point was like v like the the representative of Mars would be like causing the destruction and the Venus's segment would be fixing it. Yeah, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Um, and then you know we move on to Mercury, who who's basically like a herald for Jupiter. Um, and then Saturn, who like, you know, at first we wanted to do like a old man get off my lawn bit but it <laughs> music. um so more like a pensive moment and then uranus which is a lot more you know it's a bit more of a fun you know let's get the party started um before we go into neptune which is just ethereal you know like it's the ave maria of the piece <clears throat> Of course, the original piece is 50 minutes long, so we yeah, pretty much... So just, we're, we're, like, shortening this. Or should we basically shortened it to 25 minutes, which would still yeah. make it longer than anything that they've previously done. Oh, yeah. And then and it would still all be told in attempt, like, with one shot, of course, like, using, like, of course, using, like, blurs and panning shots. Yeah. But, but still, like, one continuous shot. Gotcha, gotcha. Basically, kind of like a day in the life of the gods. Yeah. Awesome. But, but, like but, rep but also represented by the planets. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Well, uh, shoot. Uh, what, what's the animation style, though? I know you're saying one continuous shot, but... Uh... The plan was... The, 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 considering that the... That we... That it's kind of inspired by, like, the... Kind of, like, the names and everything... Of, of the Greek gods... And we're, well, Roman gods in this case, yeah. except for Uranus. We kind of like decide, kind of like do, kind of like, uh, you know how Hercules was kind of like inspired yeah. by, like, kind of like the uh, like the vase paintings and all that. Yeah. And like the, well, kind of like they kind of like did with that cross with some cross with like the statues, but like did it like in a more like painterly style. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Like they like basically basically right. Hercules, but more stylized. Got it. Got it. All right. Sounds good. Sounds good. Because we, because going through this, we realized that like these are all great pieces in their own right, but none of them really have a grand finale quality to them. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, but like, yeah. as a sure, whole, sure, sure. I hear you. I hear you. Yeah. Like, 
Yeah, this is very much the not on Bald Mountain Firebird. And I, I love the idea of just Penn and Teller just like, you know, closing it out in a very classy way, just looking up towards the, towards the night sky. Oh, yeah. It, you it, don't really need a final gag. No. It, it very much a, uh, no, here, here, here it is. Uh-huh. So, and we, and we both kind of, like, came across, like, because we both had thought of the planets as, like, for individual pitches of our own. Yeah, yeah, very nice, very nice. Okay, guys, um, any final thoughts on this little endeavor of ours? This was really fun. I, uh, right, these are some of my favorite things to do. Like, this is, this is definitely quite a lot of fun. I mean, I, I, don't, I wish I would have put more detail into some of mine, but into some of the picks I did, but overall, I'm, I'm still really impressed with like what we've all come up with for this. And like, they, this is a, it's like an evolution, but it also stays true to what the what Fantasia's yeah, done before. Yeah, it doesn't stray too far from the spirit of Fantasia. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. And we even incorporated like an evolution of jazz, which was kind of hinted at in with Rhapsody. I like that. I like that. Yeah. yeah. Rhapsody in Blue in 2000. So like now, if we do another Fantasia pitch, I feel like the direction we'd want to go in, and my idea would be Fantasia Future, which would essentially be to take songs that are instrumentals, but kind of like it doesn't necessarily have to be classical or jazz. It can be more modern. Uh, we can have folks like Kamasi Washington, Daft Punk, uh you know, just as long as there's no lyrics, essentially, and just really push the boundaries of uh, of Fantasia, but in a good way. Because this is kind of like dipping the toe into, uh, you know, into a little bit more of an experimental Fantasia. And Fantasia Future, I imagine, just being full-on experimental Fantasia. So that's the next project. <laughs> All right. Would maybe, you guys uh, go maybe. ahead, Jacob? Maybe, maybe, in, maybe next year, or maybe a couple of years from now. We'll see. Yeah. Would you guys like to hear a very, very, very rough acoustic cover of "Eye to Eye"? You have to think about it. <laughs> Let, let's let's hear it, Tiki. Play it's, us out. It's super rough. It's super Play rough. Play us out, Tiki. Got myself a notion And one I know that you'll understand To set the real emotion I'm reaching out for each other's hands Maybe we'll discover what we should have known all along One way or another, together's where we both belong And I'm not going to sing the chorus because it's like terrible singing the chorus All right, good night everybody Good night everybody Good night everybody United States, Canada, Mexico, Panama, Haiti, Jamaica, Brazil, 